The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. Obama stood for change. We have seen a lot of change in the past as some unknown author once wrote, first dentistry was painless, then bicycles became chainless, carriages became horseless, and many laws became forceless. Next cookery became fireless, telegraphy was wireless, cigars became nicotineless, and coffee became caffeineless. Soon oranges were seedless, putting green was weedless, college boy was hatless, and proper diet, fatless. New motor roads were dustless, later steel became rustless, tennis courts became sodless, and new religion, godless. Many changes have taken place in history and have been continuing to, and things are happening and things are taking a downturn. And nowadays it's so hard to cope up with the change that we are experiencing in our, experiencing in our life. And Christ prophesies and says in his word, in the last days, this is how it's going to be. Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming that I'm the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against a nation and kingdom against a kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. We're living in times where change is happening in such a rapid and dramatic way not only in our personal lives, right? not only with the cell phones, but happens in every capacity, in every level, national, political, global scale. We are seeing things change so dramatically, so drastically. And apparently there's a new form of depression, a psychological issue that people are facing. This depression is because of the lack of an ability of an individual to cope up with change. So we're living in times which has been really tough. So what is there for us to depend on? Or who or what is there to, uh, for us is there to depend on in order to cope up with this changing world? Answer, an unchanging God. The Bible says that He is eternal, immortal, in, invisible, the only God. He's a God who's not uh, changing. He's, there is no varying shadows in Him. This God is a God of reality, of history and truth, who keeps his word based on his promises, and he doesn't change his mind. He's time-tested and is proven to be real. And we are here today, 2,000 years later, based upon the promises he made to you and I, that he not only saves us and rescues us, he also says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He also says that he's coming back for us again. If God is a, like a man who lies and constantly changes his mind, we are in big trouble. But thankfully, the Bible says he's unchanging. With this unchanging God in the heavens, I want us to wind us back in time. I want to take you back to the 8th century. The circumstances were troubling. There was a time where there was a king who reigned for 52 years. Not a dictator, a king who reigned for 52 years in the land called Judea. His name was King Uzziah. But in the 8th century, tragedy stuck. King Uzziah died. A king who's been there on the throne for 52 years. He came as a young boy. He became a king. He ruled for 52 years. And when such a favorable king dies, the nation will be shaken up. It's a time 
where the last significant spiritual reform, reform was brought about by this king named Uzziah in the land of Judea. And after that, Israel went into slavery to sin. It never recovered until the coming of Christ. It was the same time that King Uzziah died. There was a young boy, a young infant who was born. His name was Romulus. Same year. Romulus was the one who eventually became the founder of Rome. We know all about Rome and what it did during those days. The most powerful kingdom that suppressed every other, the most dominant kingdom in the world. A big cultural change took place everywhere. A time of transition, a crucial point in history when King Uzziah died. When King Uzziah died, there was a prophet in that town. His name was Isaiah. He mourned. He was in a tremendous grief and shock with the loss of his, one of the favorable kings or the favorite kings who sought about spiritual reform. When the last hope for the nation of Judah, Judah the land of Judah, the kingdom, the southern kingdom of uh, Judah was lost, Prophet Isaiah went into the dumps. Emotionally, physically, and probably spiritually, he was completely drained out. Probably he's just hoping for change. A man of God, appointed by God, wasn't seeing fruit in his life, and probably he was going down in his morale. And probably he thought it's the end of his calling. Probably he thought about quitting and giving up ministry. Probably he thought, well, there's little fruit, and the last thread of hope I got is broken. King Uzziah died, and probably Isaiah was in the dumps. But you know what? God never abandons his children. God does something so phenomenal that shakes up the prophet and gives him a new hope. This is what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Despite the gloom, despite the mourning of an earthly king, or the loss of an earthly king, Isaiah had some phenomenal encounter where his perspective Move from the death of an earthly king to the life in an eternal king. From mourning, he went into the majestic presence of the Most High God. Probably entered the temple to grieve that day. Probably went with a heart that is completely broken. But all of a sudden, God did something so spectacular. He took him into his throne room. What I'm about to share right now could be something might feel like it's not the same sermon, but there's a little detour I want to take you through with this something that will bring things into perspective. Here is Isaiah in this land of Judah. Probably imagine this little land of Judah and there's a temple and there's Isaiah like a little speck somewhere kneeling down in grief. And just watch this video. To gain perspective with the aid of computer animation, let's now travel with the Earth to the Sun at 100 times the speed of light. From this view, we begin to appreciate the magnitude of our own star. Over one million Earths would fit inside the sun. Yet our sun is an average-sized star. Many stars in our own galaxy dwarf it. Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the night sky. Though 200 trillion miles away, this orange giant is visible to the naked eye. 
By moving our sun next to Arcturus, we can grasp its immensity. Arcturus is 100 times brighter, with a radius 20 times greater than the sun's. Yet even Arcturus appears small when compared with the supergiant Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse has a radius 600 times that of our sun. A reddish star, it shines a remarkable 60,000 times brighter than the sun. However, even Betelgeuse is not the largest star in our galaxy. Several red supergiants in the Milky Way are even larger. Some with a radius 1,500 times that of our sun. Let's get some things in perspective right now. Here is Isaiah, the most insignificant man so small on this planet called Earth, and he did not travel in the physical dimension. He entered a place where the God who made, the Bible says in Genesis 1.16, he made the stars also. Okay? How magnificent is this God, and this God seems like he removed the veil of heaven and ushered in Isaiah into his presence. The reason why I put these two things together is for us to understand and comprehend that Isaiah got an audience with the God, with not just the creation, but the creator of the heavens and the earth. Can you see the magnitude? That's why King David says in Psalms, he says this in Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him, that the son of man that you should visit him? And that phenomenal to even think, ladies and gentlemen, this is huge. For a person who is in the dumps in the 8th century, because of the loss of an earthly king, all of a sudden enters the room of the creator himself. And God unveils himself. What happens when God unveils himself? Well, I can only limit what I can, what Isaiah saw with the words of human understanding with my limited capacity of my mind. I can only recreate the scenario with the with what the scripture says, but that experience could have been so phenomenal, even our, the best Hollywood director could not be able to replicate what Isaiah felt. This is what he said, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The word that is used for the word, uh, for the word Lord is the word Adonai. Adonai is one of the most exalted titles for God. And Adonai in the scripture refers to the pre-incarnate Christ himself. He didn't say he saw Yahweh, yod heh vav it's the name of the Father God. Isaiah saw Christ before he came down to earth. We should all remember that Christ was with the Father even before he came to this earth. That's why he says in John 17, verse 5, this is what Christ is praying, and he says, Now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. We can't imagine what Christ was like before he became flesh and dwelt among us. In all his glory, he was dwelling in the presence of God. And Bible says, Isaiah saw Adonai, Christ himself, high and lifted up. It's symbolic of the power and authority that he possessed. And the words when it says Christ was seated on the throne symbolize that the king is about to pronounce a judgment. The king sits on the throne to pronounce judgment. That's what it means. And then it says, the train of his robe filled the temple. What does that mean? The train of his robe filled the temple. 
Isaiah, Isaiah was experiencing the visual majesty of the Most High God, and he says the train of his robe filled the temple. What does that mean? Very simple. The length, listen to this, the length of the robe denotes the majesty of a king. The length of the robe denotes the majesty of the king. And Isaiah says the train of the robe filled the temple. That's how majestic this king of kings was that Isaiah beheld. And then in verse 2, you know, travel with me with Isaiah. Probably, I don't know, what was he? Kneeling and saying, God, you're the most. Probably he was crawling on his face. I don't know what kind of experience it was, like John on Patmos, in his throne is the radiance and the brilliance of God, and he's probably crawling on his face, and all of a sudden, he, he hears these sounds, he's, he sees these things that are so, so draining. He's not looking at the sun, he's looking at the one who made that sun. I wish I can replicate this scenario. I wish I can understand this scenario myself. What a phenomenal experience. And then he says, above it stood, for the throne stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, they covered the face. With two, they covered the feet. With two, he flew. So only mention the word seraphim in the scriptures. These are specialized kind of angels that are mentioned here. Why are they specialized? Because they have to survive in the glorious presence of God. And in order to survive that presence and that atmosphere where they were worshiping God, they were given six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two, they were flying. With two, they covered their feet. Why did they cover their face? Probably the answer is pretty simple. The piercing glory of God had to be shielded from. Otherwise, probably they would be gone, goners. Remember there's one incident that happened in the Old Testament where Moses goes up Mount Sinai and God calls him up. And it says, God, Moses says to God, God, you did some things. I witnessed your miracles and you've been a great God. I like to see you, Lord. I like to see you, Moses says to God. You know what God says? Moses, you know better. You know if you look at me, you'll die. But he does something wonderful. He takes Moses and puts him in the cleft of the rock and shows him his passing glory. Like, quick. You like the sound effect? Yeah, it, was a, it was a quick passing glory. Remember the beautiful spiritual significance? If you want to see the glory of the Father, you have to hide in the rock. That rock is Christ. He has to place you in the cleft of the rock. That's the only way. That's why Christ says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. But this passing glory, Moses has it all over his face. Probably it was like searing heat. He comes down the mountain. And the people are screaming. Israelites say, Moses, cover your face. You're too bright. Veil yourself so Moses has to put a cloth over his face because he was glowing. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the old covenant, Old Testament without Christ. The passing glory people couldn't handle. And the New Testament, you know what the Bible says? The veil has been removed. You know the privilege that you and I have? to experience and walk into the holy of holies because the veil is torn into two? Why should I be like the one that is veiled in songs of songs? You don't have to. You don't have to struggle into the presence, enter into the presence of God because of what Christ has done. New covenant. What a privilege. You can walk in and hear his eyes here beholding the glory of uh, God and the angels are flying and the sound probably is so phenomenal. I forget you know, when, I first, when we first bought our house, uh, we had a wallpaper in the house. It's all these naked little cherubs with stars in their hands all over the wall. I'm like, these are not angels, but they had six wings. 
The cute but. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about seraphim, which means burning. They were burning in the presence of God. Probably they're so magnificent, the wingspan, I have no clue. But the sound and the fluttering and probably, imagine God seated on the throne like this. And probably maybe one of his little finger moved, just like that. Imagine the angels could not handle the presence, boom, they slam against the wall, fall down, get up and start flying again. They couldn't handle the slightest change in the static glory of God, static electricity, vocabulary problems there. We're struggling, we're struggling here. But why did they cover their feet? The angel said, the angels covered their feet. When Moses was at the burning bush, what does the Lord tell? Moses, take off your sandals. The place you're standing is holy. Feet denote the creatureliness of an individual. What's the difference between seraphim and us? They cover their face. They cover their feet. We have a face. We have feet. That's where we are limited to. It's a sign of submission to the Most High God. You cannot pretend, you cannot be somebody to enter into the presence of God. We need to submit ourselves as we stand before the Most High God. Submission is not bending to the least possible height. Submitting means to stand before God who shows how small you are. That's how we learn true submission. Stand before God and you feel so inadequate by the unbearable presence of God. That's the way we learn submission. They were covering their feet. That's why Psalmist says, 103, 15 and 16, As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, It is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. You know the strange thing with this scripture? When the friends that you have, all of a sudden they call away to another location. You feel like, oh man, somebody is ripped apart from your life. You feel the pain. They are gone away, say, for a few years. And when they come back, you know what happens? It becomes hard for us to accommodate them again because its place remembers it no more. Now that void is filled and all of a sudden they come, it's like, oh, we got to adjust ourselves to welcome them. Isn't that strange? We got one shot at life. We live and we die. What's the legacy we leave behind? Generations come, generations go. We are so creaturely. That's what I'm trying to get at. But the strange thing is, it's not about the appearance of these angels that we are concerned about this morning. It's the message. What were they saying? They, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. With zeal and fervency, in unanimity, they cried out to one another, this seraphim. And they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I don't know how it would have sounded like. It's only a speculation. When somebody says, what is the angel's voice like? I mean, you have keyboard settings for angels' tones and stuff. It's like, ah. That's what it sounds like. But when they were crying out to one another, I said, holy, I don't think it was like that. I personally, I'm sorry to say, probably they were screaming in the glory and brilliance of their voices that God gave, and they were uttering this phenomenal word multiple times, and it was so powerful, so authoritative. They were crying out to one another. They were not whispering, they were crying out to one another. Emotions would have surged for Isaiah. Remember, he's watching all this. Emotions, fear, terror, love, multiple attributes of God being felt by a limited human being in that confines. Imagine what he's going through. 
you know, there's something so wonderfully Jewish that is happening here. You know, in English language, when you want to express the importance of something, you say it's, you color code it, say it's important, or you underline it. But when I first came to Dallas, people were doing this. I said, why are you scratching the air? That's what I asked. I said, Kamal is a special guy. I never knew what that was. And he says, it's important. Important. We try to highlight that. But in the Jewish culture, they did something. In order to highlight the importance of anything, they repeated it. Repetition. You'll see the example in the scriptures. In Galatians, it says, even if Paul says, even if we or the angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. That means when he's repeating something, it means it's super important. That's why Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. Christ in his ministry, many important things. Everything he said is phenomenally important. But times he paused and he said, what? Truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen, I say unto you. Repetition to underscore the importance of what he's saying. But here is the beautiful part. There's only one attribute of God that is taken to another level. It's not mercy. It's not love. It's not grace. It's not anything else. But it's the word holy has been taken to another level by the seraphim when they're crying out. God is not holy. God is not holy, holy. God is holy, holy, and holy. Holy. To, to stress the importance of the nature of God, the angels were crying out this. Some scholars say holy, holy, holy is because of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It sat well with me for a while, but until I understood the Jewish context, it didn't make sense. This is one attribute of God that is taken to a whole other level. What does this word holy mean? The primary meaning of the word holy is very simple. It means separate. God is separate. What does that even mean? My friends, God that you and I serve is not common. God that you and I serve is not our buddy or a grandpa sitting in the clouds. No, no, no. The God that we serve cannot be brought down to our opinions and our ideas because he is separate. He's holy. The word is kadosh in Hebrew, which means he's utterly and uniquely distinct, sacred, set apart. He alone is trustworthy. He alone deserves true worship and devotion. God doesn't need peers and friends. What all he needs, he is and he has. He's without a rival. And how we stand in relationship with the Most High God is he is the creator. We are his creation. Let's not change those standards. You know, one of the tragedy I find with our culture, even with our young people, they are not taught how to respect the older folk. In school systems everywhere, you see the lack of respect. You know, and that's the same attitude they're also being taught about their God. Hey, buddy, hey, Jesus is my best buddy. The Bible says he's separate. Yes, the Bible says he's the friend of sinners, but the Bible also says he's separate from sinners in Hebrew. God is separate. Our expectations to modify this God and bring him into our own standards and our own perception to make him comfortable and fit into the scenario doesn't work because God is holy. 
how holy he is, let me read a few things that the Scripture says. I'll just condense these things into these phrases that some men of God spoke about Christ. He is the king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of the age, king of heaven and earth. He is the king of glory, the supernatural king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's how separate he is. The Bible also says he's enduring, enduringly strong, he's entirely sincere, he's eternally steadfast, he's immortally graceful, he's imperially powerful, he's impartially merciful. That's the kind of God we serve who is separate. He's the greatest phenomena that ever crossed the history of the world. He's God's son, a sinner's savior, the centerpiece of civilization who stands in the solitude of himself. He's awesome, he's unique, he's unparalleled, he's the loftiest idea in literature, he's the sweetest chord of our knowledge, the highest personality in philosophy, he's supreme mystery and higher, supreme mystery and higher criticism, fundamental doctrine, he is the fundamental doctrine of true theology, he's the core in the necessity of our faith, he's the miracle of our ages, he's the superlative of every good that you can choose to call him, he's the only one who qualified himself to be in all sufficient savior. He saves us, sympathizes with us, he strengthens us, sustains us, guards us, guides us, heals us, cleanses us, forgives us, rescues us, delivers us, defends us, blesses us, serves us, guards us, rewards us, beautifies us, and he gives us the knowledge, he gives us the wellspring of wisdom, he is the doorway of deliverance, he is the pathway of peace, he is the roadway of righteousness, the highway of holiness, the gateway of glory, his office is manifold, his promises are a guarantee, his life is matchless, his goodness is limitless, his mercy is everlasting, his love never changes, his word is enough, his grace is sufficient, he reigns in righteousness, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. This man of God said, I wish I can describe him. And then he says, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. He's an almighty God. He's the great I am. He's self-existent, eternal, unchangeable. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He's incomprehensible, faithful, and true, unchangeable. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a memorial unto all generations. The Pharisees could not stand him, they found, but they found they could not stop him. Pilate could not find any fault in him. The witnesses could not agree with the testimony. Herod could not kill him, death could not have him, the grave could not hold him. Yes, he is separate. I wish these words are adequate enough to wrap up our God and package him, but they're not. Unless we distinguish and separate this God from us, we will have a wrong perspective of who we are following and who we are serving is holy, holy, and holy. And yet, the second part of this verse, it says, the whole earth is filled with His glory. God is not confined to Himself. He chooses to reveal Himself through His creation. And heavens declare the glory of God. The handiwork bears His signature. His presence is revealed to you and I. You know the masterpiece of His creation? You know what it is? It's you and I. When He created man in His image, it reflects the holiness of God. It reflects the separation of God. That is why God requires you and I to be separate. Man is created to be separate from animals. He's created to be separate from everything that is sinful in nature, sin which has marred the image of man. But God called us to be separate. You know what, friends? You and I are not common. If you are a sinner saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, we are not common people. We are not ordinary. We are affected by the truth of God and our sinful nature can be changed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And your image will become like the image of Christ. You'll be transformed in the image of Christ. What a privilege. What an authority. If any person feels worthless, 
If any person feels common, it's because you don't know what image God made you, what image that God has put in you, because you don't realize that God has made you holy and separate. If you don't realize that, we feel inadequate. We feel like failures. That's why the Bible says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's what God said. Many people get scared with this commandment. Many people associate holiness with purity. True. But the primary meaning of the word holy means pure, uh, separate for God. Not pure, separate for God. And I look at this scripture, you shall be holy for I am holy. I look at it not as a commandment, I look at it as a promise in my life. I will be holy. I will be separate because my God is separate. And he can make me holy. He says that in Exodus. He's a God who makes you holy. He's a God who makes you separate from this world. But do you have the desire to be distinct, to be sacred, to be set apart for him? Are you willing to be set apart for him? You see in the nature of our Father, and he put that in you because of Christ. And he says, we have become I mean, because of what Christ has done, he has brought in many sons in glory. Many sons. To have the father and the son, means, it means we have the same genetic traits and the attributes of the Most High God put in you that need to be revealed as we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. You see what I'm talking about? How God made us, as God is transforming us with His Spirit into the likeness of His Son. But are we willing to be set apart from this world? Are we willing to be set apart from the things of this world? The Bible says the angels were crying out. Mind you, they were not singing. They were crying out. They were not crying out to one another, holy, 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 because that's their daily schedule. Nine o'clock in eternity, angels, you start batch one. Holy, holy, holy. Batch two, 1030. Holy, holy. No. They were crying out to one another, not because God told them to, or because they had to. It's because they were experiencing the presence of the Most High God that they cannot serve Him in silence anymore. I watched myself once watching a hockey game a few years ago. I bought myself a popcorn. I was eating it. As the game progressed, I was eating it so fast, I didn't even realize that. And all of a sudden, when it was that close and the goal went in, like, it was over. I couldn't remain casual watching something so visually charged how was it to be in the presence of God and so charged with this extraordinary beauty that they cannot be silent? This unstoppable urge and cry was going all over the place. Revelation 4, from verse 9, it says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall, fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You're worthy, o our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. If God means everything to us, do we have this unstoppable urge to be separate from Him? And not only that, do we have the passion within us where we are not pushed to come to church services or Bible studies or prayer meetings, but this unstoppable cry deep within pushes you where you are consumed by the calling of your Father that pushes you to be separate for Him, to worship Him. It's kind of hard, isn't it? When you sit in, when you were a kid in the school, one of my favorite parts is when a teacher asked a question and I knew the answer, I was like, uh, doing whatever it takes to get the attention. Like, 
I know you got to ask me. You know what I mean? The unstoppable urge because I knew the answer. You and I know who the answer is. Do we have the same urge to worship God? Because we know the one true God. Do we know how to surrender to Him? Do we know how to pour out ourselves before Him for who He is? Not because of what He has done. Yes, He has done great things in our life. But just because of who He is, do we know how to worship Him like the angels did? And the phenomenal thing is the Bible says, Isaiah sees, then the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. The lifeless Inanimate objects began to shake because they're beholding a holy God. What about us? How can we be so indifferent to a God that we serve? You know, this evidence of lifeless objects responding to the Creator is seen even during the time of crucifixion. In Matthew, it says, when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and He gave up His spirit, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs were broke open. In Luke 19, 39 and 40, it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Lifeless objects know how to respond. What about you and I? And this is what happens to Isaiah after that encounter. As Isaiah 6, 5 says, So I said, Woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man with unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He says, Great, I've seen the King, now I can write a book and appear on CNN Morning News. That's not the response. That is absolutely not the response. He was ravaged by the holiness of God. He was ravaged with the power and the presence of God. He simply ripped apart this man. And he said, woe is me. I'm undone. Just unraveled. He's just unraveled in the presence of God. Then something happens. Very interesting. Then one of the seraphim flew to, me, flew to me, having in his hand a live coal that he had taken from the tongs from the altar, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. With this unbearable presence of God, the only thing that could, he could find a cure, the angel realized, was a coal from the altar. The burning red hot coal. Coal symbolizes the word of God and the truth when it's put in the lips of this man who's being tormented by the holiness of God, he felt relief. My friends, truth hurts, but that's the only way you can stand in the presence of God. Truth is hard to take, but that's the only cure for sin. If you want to experience the intimacy of God and the presence of God in our lives, be prepared to be chopped up with the double-edged sword, which is the Word of God. It will separate your soul from your spirit. It will separate your life from all the things that you desire, all that your flesh craves for. And when that separation happens, you can experience the intimate presence of God. And after this encounter, Isaiah 6, 8, you also heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. After this encounter, he is ready to respond to the call for ministry. Many of us might be caught up in getting familiar with the Christian jargon and doing ministry, evangelism, uh, being a good person, quoting scriptures like a parrot. Probably you're all familiar with that Christian lifestyle. But your life begins with an encounter with the Most High God, and then only you're ready to do His will. Otherwise, you're just living a tradition and a religion that's useless. So my friends, I'm coming to the conclusion. When, when you say, when we say, 
God, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you're amazing, you're glorious, you're worthy. Do we really know who we are talking about? Do we really realize that He is not common? It's not a scare tactic. I don't want you to be afraid. But that realization is good enough that when we approach our God, it won't be the same. When you live a Christian life, when you have to love somebody, when you do it as a chore, it's not the right way to do it. Until you have this encounter with God where He leaves a scar upon your heart, unless He burns our lips with that coal, we will not be able to respond to the sound of His cry. We will not be able to respond to God, the desire and love for Him. Otherwise, we are doing religion out of duty and obligation. Don't be a Christian who is religious. I like this quote, be a religious fruit, don't be a religious nut. Be spiritual fruit, not a religious nut. Here is Isaiah. You know the beauty, beautiful thing about his life is, in Isaiah chapter, chapter 6, he encounters the glorious Christ. He encounters his majesty. But if you move a few chapters later, in Isaiah 53 and 52, he experiences and he sees how this Christ is the most high God is going to come down in humanity. And he saw the future 800 years later. This God that he beheld, the pre-incarnate Christ, God reveals to him also that he's going to come down in humanity. Same Isaiah. And he records these words in Isaiah 52, verse 1. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man. And in his form, more than the sons of men. What he's saying is, when he beheld the Christ, and when during his time of crucifixion he was describing, he says, his visage, means his appearance, was marred that he didn't look anything like a human, it seems. That's what he's saying. Isaiah saw the glory of God and also saw what would happen to him in the future when he came down in flesh. John, the gospel writer, records this, and he mentions it in John chapter 12, and he says, these things Isaiah said when he saw the glory of him, glory and spoke of him. So Isaiah is just quoting what Isaiah saw. John was just quoting what Isaiah saw. But strangely enough, this John had a similar kind of encounter. This John walked with Christ in its humanity. Remember? He walked with him in his humanity, but on the island of Patmos, he saw the glory of the resurrected Christ. Isn't that amazing? So my friends, Christ left heaven to come to earth. This infinite, most powerful Adonai that Isaiah was seeing, he con confined himself to the limitations of a human being. He left the praises of the seraphim to take the scorns of men. The infinite God became a finite being. God became a man and he chose to suffer and die for your sins and mine. That is a difficult concept to comprehend. But the, may the Holy Spirit give us the understanding of what this truth is all about. Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God, was spit upon, spat upon, beat, with whipped, accused, abused. Imagine what the dynamic was like in heaven when all these incidents were taking place with the Son of the Most High God. You know why He did that? Because He loves you and I. Because He loved Isaiah. He didn't want him to fix his eyes on the death of an earthly king and mourn and be tormented by grief and emotional turmoil. He said, Isaiah, okay, you're suffering, my son. Come in. A simple, come in, Lord. Uh, come in, Isaiah. I'll show you something. Oh, he saw something. Isn't that wonderful? 
my friends, we are living in this transition. We saw the humanity of Christ through the Gospels, what he did for you and I on the cross 2,000 years ago. Through the Gospels, we've seen what Christ has done. We've seen what the apostles have done. But most importantly, with the power of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost, that same Holy Spirit is existent in our life today, and he has transformed our lives, removed the heart of stone, replaced it with the heart of flesh, and we have an assurance of what Christ has done. And we are in a transition phase where we've seen the humanity of Christ, but yet we are about to behold the glory of the King who is coming. Christ is coming back, not to be crucified again. He's coming back in all His glory with the rod of iron to rule and reign forever and forever. We are in that transition phase. And one day, the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Imagine the day where you yourself, you and myself, and all of us in the presence of God with the seraphim are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Imagine that experience that Isaiah had. Imagine the experience the seraphim are having at this moment. Imagine This reality that you and I can be a part of that same experience that Pastor Kamal talked about one Sunday morning. Probably you'll be standing there and somebody standing next to me and say, probably Randy saying, hey, you talked about this before. And probably Randy wouldn't care whether I'm standing next to him then, right? We'll all be so lost in the glory of God that we'll be all sold out in the presence of God for all eternity This is the reality. We're going to face God face to face. Unveil. You're going to see Christ face to face. That is an exciting prospect. But my friends, in this present moment, that's of a concern for me and us. At this present moment, do we know this God who redeemed us? Or have you encountered Christ that Isaiah encountered yet If you haven't yet encountered him, ask and say, Lord, I want to meet you. You are the children of the new covenant. The way has been opened. Ask God so that he can experience his holiness, his separation. Are are you a Christian who's been stagnant in his Christian walk for the past little while? And and you're saying, I've been this rat for a while. And all of a sudden you lost the perspective of the God that you serve. And you're like, Isaiah, mourning and uh, life has to go on. Are you in that situation? You need an encounter with God. You need revival. My friends, if there's anybody here it was an absolute hopeless situation with their life. I don't have a cure for you. I don't have any medicine. But I know one cure. An encounter with the Most High God. If you're living a hopeless life at this very moment, where you're tormented by the situations around you, I pray that God would give you the grace to reveal His nature, reveal His heart, reveal who He is. And you know what? that is good enough. You may not have all the explanation for why you're going through what you're going through. Job never got an explanation for his struggles in life. But he got the perspective of the God whom he serves. All you need is that encounter. When you have that encounter, when I have that encounter, our lifestyles will change. How we treat others will change as well. So I'll conclude with this statement. Yes, we know the world is becoming godless. But an encounter with God can leave us speechless. And then, as you continue to live your life in Christ, you will not be hopeless.